Good morning and welcome to Graber Road Church of Christ worship services. We're glad that you're here with us, albeit remotely, but yet we are here to worship God together. I want to let you know, our members know, that the elders are indeed drafting an important letter that's going to highlight the first steps we need to take as a family as we make preparations for some of us to assemble once again next Sunday morning, Lord willing. Again, as God wills, these steps will continue to move back to our normal uh, interactions, but we want to do so, of course, cautiously and in order to protect our membership. We will discuss a few more of those details at this evening's service. Turn it with me, if you will, to John chapter 4. It's a very familiar passage. We often use it in opening our worship services, but it bears meditation as we enter worship. Jesus here was discussing eternal truths to a very simple Samaritan woman when she had asked of temporal and physical needs. To this woman of lowly estate, Jesus unfolded God's eternal plan for worship by the church to God that would soon come after his sacrifice. Christ also emphasized to her that the physical city where worship took place was not the issue. It was worship in spirit and truth that mattered. Now, John chapter 4, 23 and 24. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And this morning, of course, we're not assembled physically together for reasons that are beyond our control. However, we do join together spiritually in worship to God. Let us now join in song. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Pray with me. 
Our kind Father in heaven, we're gathered together, not physically, Father, but we are gathered together in spirit to praise your name and to, to sing our praises to you, Father. We're grateful for this time when, when you've called us together to worship you. We look forward to the time when we can be in your presence. We look forward to that time when we can join with the angels in heaven, cast down our crown and bow before you and worship, worship in your presence. Until then, Father, we are, we are joyful. We're proud. We're happy to offer our worship to you this morning with the rest of the saints. We're thankful, Father, that we have opportunity this morning to remember what our Lord has done for us. We're thankful that we have the memorial service that reminds us just how much you loved mankind. We pray that you'll help us to use that to, to strike our heart and to, to prick our heart that we might never forget the price that you paid, that our Lord paid for our salvation. Our Father, we thank you for those who've prepared this service and we ask that you'll give that you'll give the preacher this morning good recollection father we pray that you'll help us to be attentive we pray that you'll help us to sing with a melody and joy in our heart that we might glorify you till that day we can be there in heaven for we pray in jesus name amen Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn Before we commune together in the partaking of the Lord's Supper, please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6, verses 47 through 58. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. 
Please bow with me before we partake of the bread. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity we have as your body to gather around this table and to remember our Lord and Savior's death on a cruel cross. Father, we are reminded that Jesus gave up his place in heaven because of his great love for us and did your will by coming to this earth to live a perfect life and then to humbly go to that cross for each and every one of us, Father. Father, as we partake of this bread, we are reminded of the pain and suffering that our Lord and Savior went through. We're reminded of the terrible consequences of sin, of separation from you, Father. And we're so thankful that because of Jesus' sacrifice, that we are no longer separated from you and can abide in you through Jesus' body and through his blood, Father. Please be with each one of us now as we partake of this bread. We pray this through Jesus' name. Amen. Please bow with me again. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we partake of this cup now, we remember Jesus' precious blood that he willingly shed on the cross for each and every one of us, Father. We're reminded that his blood cleanses us and makes us holy and allows us to stand before you and have a relationship with you, Father. Father, we are also reminded that it was our sins that put Jesus on the cross and caused him to shed his blood and to lose his life and to be separated from you. And we're sorry for that, Father, but we're so thankful for the love that was shown to us, for the grace that's been extended to us, and for the opportunity we have to overcome death through Jesus' sacrifice. Please be with each one of us now as we partake of this cup. We pray this through Jesus' name, amen. Let's have a prayer for our offering. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we, we know that you are the creator. We know that you are the giver of all good things. We know, dear Lord, that everything that we have comes from you. And dear Lord, we just ask that uh, you be with us as we give back to you this morning some of the blessings that you have given us. Dear Lord, we, we know that the greatest gift you ever gave us was your son on Calvary's cross. As we give these funds, let them be used in a way that will glorify you and that will spread your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray, amen. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his
Prior to this morning's lesson, if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 15, we'll be reading verses 36 to the close of the chapter. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with him John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And then the contention became so sharp that he departed, they departed from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, preaching or strengthening the churches. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. We're glad that you've joined us for our worship services. As uh, Doug mentioned a few moments ago, let me also say Happy Mother's Day. If you wouldn't, just as we begin this morning, would you bow together with me for a word of prayer, please? Our God in heaven, how great and awesome you are. How wonderful you are, Father, to place mothers in our lives. And Father, this morning we offer up a special prayer for all those, especially, Father, for those who have lost mothers. We pray for those who have a strained relationship with their mothers. We pray for those who long to be with their mothers, but they can't. We pray for those who are experiencing the broken dreams of motherhood. We pray for those who are adoptive mothers. We pray for those who have never met their mothers. We pray for those mothers who have buried children, whether miscarried, aborted, or gone too soon. We pray for those who are foster mothers and those who mother children who are not their own. We pray, Father, special blessing on those who are stepmothers, for those who are new mothers still wondering when they actually might sleep. We pray, Father, for our spiritual mothers. We pray for those who choose to have children and are, choose not to have children and are stigmatized for it. We pray, Father, for those who dread Mother's Day because of its painful reminders of loss. We pray for those who are mothers and who are honored for it. We pray for mothers who long to be with their children today, especially because of the coronavirus and the difficulties it's caused, but cannot. For all of our mothers, for all of us, Father, who have mothers, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we turn our attention to our lesson this morning and thinking about keeping distancing from destroying, we turn our attention to the scripture that Roy read for us just a few moments ago from Acts chapter 15. You remember that Acts is the book of history of the church. It is the acts of the early church and the acts of the apostles in really getting the church off the ground and getting it started as Christ wanted it to be. And as you read through the book of Acts, you discover how the Christians began to go everywhere preaching the word and how there were disciples that were being made of all nations, Jews and Gentiles. That's Romans chapter 1 verse 16. And as the church begins to grow and expand, you find a number of problems that begin to crop up just in the life and the nature of the church for however long it had been in existence. 
And in fact, when you get to Acts chapter 15, what's happened is Paul and Silas and Paul and Barnabas have been on this missionary journey, and as they get through with it, they discover that there are some people that are coming in and beginning to teach, well, listen, unless you are circumcised as a, uh, as a Jew was, you can't be a part of the kingdom of God. You can't be part of Christ. You have no part with him if you don't adhere to the outward ritual of circumcision. And Acts chapter 15 details how the apostles and how the church leaders came together in what we call the Jerusalem meeting. And they have to discuss this and they have to work through it because this is a serious matter of doctrine. And they certainly didn't want to divide the church based upon what had happened and based upon uh, people that were teaching. They wanted to hold on to what was right. And they come to a conclusion, they craft this uh, carefully worded letter to say, these are the things we're going to adhere to, we're not going to command anybody to be circumcised, because listen, that's not a part of the gospel and doctrine of Christ, at least outwardly. Romans would have something to do about being circumcised inwardly. But when you get to the end of Acts chapter 15, it's interesting to me that the question of whether to take or not to take becomes in full view. And you get to Acts chapter 15 and you see something of the contention between two of the heavyweights, between Paul and between Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas are staying here and they're strengthening and encouraging the church there at Antioch. And in verse 36, Paul says, listen, we're going to start and let's go back over the ground that we've retread. Let's go back and let's strengthen all the churches that we visited already. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this with a new perspective because they've been a part of what's been called the Jerusalem meeting. But Paul and Barnabas begin to get into a difficult situation between two brothers. To take John Mark or not to take John Mark. Barnabas says we should take him, absolutely. Let's get him on the ship. Let's get him involved in this work and let's do it, absolutely. Paul's not so sure. Paul says, I don't don't think we should. I think we need to leave John Mark here And we just need to go on on our own. Verse 37, the Bible says that Barnabas was determined. The word determined is resolved. He took counsel. He thought about things deeply. He considered. And then he made up his mind, this is the right thing to do. We're going to take John Mark with us. If you go to Colossians chapter 4 and verse 10, you see that John Mark was actually Barnabas' cousin. I don't know if family had anything to do with it, but Barnabas, being the son of encouragement, really wanted to take John Mark with him. Paul, verse 38. The King James reads, Paul thought no good. <laughs> uh, the literal word for no good means kept insisting. He thought not best. He was of the opinion. Paul had made up his mind. John Mark is not going to go with us under any circumstances. If you are into writing in your Bible, write the cross-reference of Acts chapter 13 and verse 13. That reference there to verse 38 is from Acts 13 and verse 13. They were in the middle of the first missionary journey. And what had happened was they got to Pamphylia, they, they began to do their work, and for whatever reason... For however that happened, John Mark said, that's it, I'm done. He got on a ship and he went back to Jerusalem. Well, that seems like, according to the way Luke records it here in verse 38, that that didn't sit well with Paul. And as Mark left them and Pamphylia and stopped working with them, John departed from them. He returned to Jerusalem. And verse 39, you've got one brother on one side saying, we absolutely need to take John Mark. And the other one on the other side saying, we absolutely don't need to take John Mark. The contention became so sharp. The word there indicates blood was boiling There was a really severe irritation. There was exasperation between Paul and between Barnabas, the son of encouragement. And there was a rising, this provocation. It's almost like they came to blows. And here's the question that they're dealing with. They still got along with John Mark going with Barnabas and Paul going with Silas. And both of them in this conclusion, decided that they weren't going to hurt the church for the sake of their judgment. Keeping distancing from destroying. We treat sometimes the old adage, in matters of faith, unity, but in matters of judgment, friction, disunity, 
I'm going to hold on to my opinion and you're going to hold on to your opinion and I'm going to treat my opinion just like it's a matter of faith, just like it's something that I can hold on to and it doesn't matter the collateral damage, it doesn't matter your opinion, it doesn't matter your feelings on the matter, I'm going to hold on to this. And there is a potential, brothers and sisters, as we think about coming back together, there is a potential for division and hurt and pain I believe in the church as a greater point in our lives in thinking about how much we're holding on to our opinions and how much we're looking at matters of judgment and we're saying, no, 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 this is the exact right thing that we need to do. Paul thought social distancing from John Mark was the best thing in this situation. In essence, that's what he thought. Barnabas thought that it was no big deal to take John Mark along with them for their journey. That sound kind of like what we're dealing with today? To mask or not to mask? To gather or not to gather? To quarantine or not to quarantine? To go to Lowe's or not to go to Lowe's? And all these questions that we have, listen, there are strong feelings and strong opinions based upon what we've been told in the outside world and based upon all the information that we've, uh, we've gathered. We've made a choice and we've made a judgment about what's best. The issue is that we can't let those choices and those details and those conclusions that we've drawn destroy the church. We can't let those things affect our love and our mission to save souls. You see, we can't forge our mission to save souls if we're not tempered both by the doctrine and the love of Christ. It's not about just believing what's right. It's also about adhering to the principles of love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's about not looking down on somebody else just because they make a different choice than we do. It's not about looking down on somebody just because they choose something different than we do. And there's a danger to divide the church based upon external factors and preferences and judgments. And folks, we've got to be careful about those things. And we've got to be careful about what we say and how we say it and what we do and how we do it. Let me give you six principles just from Acts chapter 15 this morning that we need to think about with regard to keeping distancing from destroying. Good and faithful brethren, that's you and me. That's people that are going to be coming back together in a worship service before too long. Good and faithful brethren, number one, may agree on matters of faith and judgment. We may agree on matters of faith and judgment. If we look at this and think about what's right, I'm not interested in compromising something that the Bible says. Thus saith the Lord, something that the New Testament Jesus has clearly uh, communicated, the apostles have clearly relayed, and how the church has car faithfully carried out those things, those sacred divine traditions. We're not interested in changing any of those things, and that's great. And how we go about accomplishing what's right, evangelism and worship and benevolence. In some places in Scripture, God tells us exactly what he wants and how he wants us to accomplish it. Those things are not up for debate. They're not up for judgment. There are places we can go in, in the New Testament and see, and other places there's matters of, well, like what we're looking at here in Acts 15, judgment. To take John Mark or not to take John Mark. We cannot forget that there's passages in the Bible, in the New Testament that teach, listen, we can disagree based upon your opinion versus my opinion, but there's still a purpose and a cause to go forward, and that is the cause of Christ. It's interesting to me that it doesn't matter how many times that John and Bar uh, excuse me, uh, Paul and Barnabas had, had agreed before. The one that stands out in our minds when we talk about the difficulties of the relationship is this one that comes back here in Acts chapter 15. Good brethren may agree on matters of faith and many matters of judgment. Number two, good brethren may and do often differ on matters of judgment. We're not talking about changing the gospel message. The same chapter begins with folks who are trying to change the gospel message. You look back at Acts 15 and verse 1. Uh, we mentioned a moment ago the people that were saying, unless you're circumcised, you can't be saved. And Paul had in verse 2 no small dissension. I love the way Luke records those things. It's like he tries to understate it, to overstate it, to make sure the people get the message. Paul was giving, a, giving these people a time, and there was strife that was involved. 
And after they gathered these church leaders and nailed down exactly what God had said and said it's not a matter up to judgment, this section here in Acts 15, verses 37 to 38, Paul and Barnabas didn't gather the church together and say, all right, let's take a show of hands. Who thinks that this is the best way to do it? Okay, who thinks that this is the best way to do it? Should we take John Mark or not? All in favor, say aye. It wasn't one of those because it was just a matter of judgment. There are people who have looked at choices that churches have made based upon the difficulty that we are engaged in with the coronavirus and with uh, what the governments are saying and how they're, they're trying to keep people safe and how they're trying to protect life and trying to, to make sure that people are not exposed unnecessarily. And so the question becomes for elderships and for churches to consider, should we assemble or should we virtually assemble? There are people that have been taken to task on both sides. To wear a mask or not to wear a mask. To, to come back immediately or not to come back immediately. To quarantine or not to quarantine. To continue Bible classes or not to continue Bible classes. The danger is, is that we've all got judgments and we all make a judgments about each one of these things and let that difference in judgment affect the unity that we ought to be preserving in the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. Listen, we're trying to do what's right. We're all trying to do what's right, and we're all trying to do what's best for not only ourselves, but also for our neighbors. That's Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And when it comes to matters of judgment, you and I don't have to see completely eye to eye on those things. But we do have to respect the supremacy of what God has said. Number three, brethren may differ sharply on matters of personal judgment. Paul and Barnabas, two different personalities, two completely different personalities if, if, uh, if you understand uh, how they're described as characters in the, in the Bible. God didn't make Paul and Barnabas exactly the same. We've got to appreciate that. How out of many we are one, e pluribus unum is written on our money. It's written on a lot of different places to characterize us as Americans and thinking about how there's, there's people of all different varieties and, and nationalities and people of all different backgrounds and how we come together in one nation under God. That's still on our, that's still in our, our important documents. But how much more so when we think about members of the body of Christ we are all people who have come and stood at the foot of the cross and said, yes, I need what this man offers. Yes, I need what God offers. Yes, I need that salvation. And yes, I need the washing of the blood of Jesus. And yes, I need his salvation. Without it, I'm lost. And as we all stand on equal ground at the foot of the cross, we still may not see eye to eye. Interesting assignment. Go through your New Testament and see how many times you have brethren that maybe didn't see eye to eye on every, everything. And the things that were doctrinal related. You find Paul and the other apostles and the other inspired writers dealing with those things and helping those people to, to come to an understanding of the doctrine of Christ and the unity that ought to be present in the church. But when you've got people that don't agree like what's happening here in Acts chapter 15, uh, what's happening, we think about God doesn't expect you and me to be on the same and, and to see eye to eye on every matter of judgment. We could thank God for elderships. We could thank God for Holy Spirit appointed, according to Acts chapter 20, elderships that can look at and make the choice and make the judgment based upon what's best. In matters of expediency, they rule in matters of judgment and what's best for each congregation. And, and let me tell you something, elders don't always agree and see eye to eye when they're hashing things out and thinking about things in the meetings. And, and there's sometimes sharp disagreements that come upon them whenever they're talking about things. But there's a unity there when the elders leave out of that room and begin to communicate things to the congregation. At least there should be. And when those things are communicated, the elders are stand shoulder to shoulder and they say, this is what's best in this matter of judgment. This is what we're going to proceed with. Well, when we think about our lives and we think about what we've internalized over the last several months especially, 
there are people that are absolutely convinced. There are some of us that are absolutely convinced that everybody ought to be wearing masks. And they will have data, and they will have all kinds of of, uh, scientific articles and things that back those things up and say, this is the reason why we all need to be wearing masks. And there are other people with just as much judgment and such as much knowledge and just as many scientific studies on the other side that say, no, 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 the masks don't do anything. Well, are we really going to look at either one of these and say, well, this person is less than this person just because they choose to wear a mask and they don't choose to wear a mask? We can divide over matters of judgment, you see, because of the opinions that we hold. Well, there can be sharp disagreements And what's going to happen is those things are going to pierce shallow bonds of fellowship. Where the church is no more than just a social club to some people. Where church relationships are not as deep and as strong as they ought to be. And where Christians are shallow superficially in the bonds of Christ, sometimes those matters of judgment and sometimes those things can really begin to destroy the fellowship that ought to be so cherished in the body of Christ. There's no reason, and there's no reason to divide the church over matters of judgment. Number four, sometimes good brethren can often have compelling reasons for their judgments, very compelling reasons for their viewpoints. Who would you side with, Paul or Barnabas? Paul or Barnabas? There are some that may think more and say, I'm going to go with Barnabas because John Mark, he probably had his reasons for demanding him back in Pamphylia. Oh, he probably had something that was pressing that he needed to go for, and whatever the reason was, that's past failures, no, no reason to exclude uh, um, present desire. But at the same time, there may be those on the other side that are thinking and saying, no, 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 no. I'm not about to take somebody along that's already got a history and a track record of abandoning and failure and not following through with this task. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that could make a great argument for John Mark being taken with Paul and Barnabas. There are a lot of people that can make great arguments like Paul, I'm sure could. I'd hate to get into a debate with Paul. But when you look at Paul and uh, think about his logic and think about his reasoning and making strong, rational arguments about why we shouldn't take John Mark. Which one was right? Which one was right? They could have strong, compelling reasons. And their strong, compelling reasons in differing in matters of judgment, it's interesting that Paul and Barnabas chose to make the choice not to work so closely together as they had. You notice at the end of the chapter, the solution was Paul took Silas and he went one direction and Barnabas took John Mark and they went another direction. There may be very compelling reasons for you to choose what you choose and for us to choose what we choose when it comes time to come back together. We'll talk more about that in just a moment and make specifics. But we've got to realize, once again, these are not matters of faith. These are matters of opinion and judgment, and we've got to be very careful in those situations. Number five... Good and faithful brethren should not hurt and divide the body of Christ in matters of judgment. It's been often concluded about this chapter, and I wholeheartedly agree that instead of dividing the church, they doubled the work and continued. Paul and Barnabas had compelling reasons, but they didn't divide their church, or excuse me, didn't divide the church because of their viewpoint. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. As Paul writes this, he's talking about walking worthy of the calling with which we've been called. And he says, church, I want you to walk lowly, with all lowliness and gentleness, with all all long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. As Paul writes this epistle years later from this occasion, I can't help but think he thinks back to this event we're studying this morning from Acts chapter 15 endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It's not a matter of writing off your Christian brothers and sisters that don't see the way that you see. 
And it's not a matter of taking this matter of judgment and saying, no, 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 I can't see past this, and I choose not to see past this. Therefore, you go your direction. I'm not coming back. I'm not getting along with you anymore. As the elders talk about what it's going to look like when we assemble again. As the elders talk about things and trying to put precautions in place with regard to things like handshaking, hugs, a shoulder to grab onto and say, I'm so glad to see you. I want that as much as you do. Of course, maybe you're on the opposite side and you don't necessarily uh, like those things uh, generally when we're not under, uh, under uh, threat of a coronavirus. And I appreciate those people that, that really want and really need those things. But listen, in order to be respectful, the elders are going to have to take some things and say, listen, these are matters of judgment and we're, we're wanting to respect these, these certain details about this. The difficulty comes in let me just relay something that happened not too long ago. I was at a place where Christians were assembled. And as we're still under this, this, this difficulty of the coronavirus, we were keeping our distance six feet apart and doing all of those socially uh, mandated and socially recommended things that our, uh, that our government says that are going to help keep us safe. And as I was going up to greet a brother, I reached out my elbow to give him an elbow bump and the, the words came out of his mouth and said, oh, you're one of those. Well, it wasn't too long before I was being carried along to the point where we were doing those things, hugging and shaking hands and all those things that we're accustomed to, and not really even considering that there may have been some people there among us that were terrified of those things and, and certainly not wanting to participate in those things. And the temptation is going to be there to want to try and lower the barriers or change somebody's opinion. You know that mask that you're wearing is, is not really doing anything. Oh, you're not wearing a mask? Don't you realize that you're going to, that you're going to be an, an, an infector or you're going to be infected? And we may look at one another and we may make these judgments based upon one another when, listen, they are still matters of judgment. And as our elders lay down what's going to be important about coming back together and about observing those things that, that, uh, that they've deemed best, brothers and sisters, we dare not hurt the body of Christ because of what we've internalized and what we think is best in our minds and what we think about others that may not have the same viewpoint and have the same judgment that we do. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Number six, we can be blessed by God and we can be a blessing to others when we recognize that matters of judgment are just that, matters of judgment. And looking at a soul who may be on Sunday, Lord willing, if we gather back together in a week, who may be wearing a mask or may not be wearing a mask, as I look and I see a person who has chosen to stay home because they're part of that high-risk uh, that, that high contingency, I appreciate that. And as we look at somebody else that may be here and may want to experience a fellowship, and as we look at those things and make, uh, see those people, we want to be a blessing to them. And we want to encourage them, and we want to help them, and we want to be respectful for them and concerning ourselves with what really matters. We can take joy in simply being together, even though we don't see eye to eye on every detail. The psalmist said in Psalm 133 in verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The truth is, opinions and matters of judgment change over time. They just do. Anybody hold the exact same opinion about all of this that we're dealing with here in this country as they did at the very beginning? Anybody exactly right in line with what they held on to whenever it was very beginning and talking about people staying home, stay home, stay safe, versus now when things, at least in Texas, have begun to open up? 
Anybody exactly in the same place where they were about masks, about where they were with regard to self-quarantine or, or shelter in place? Anybody exactly holding those same opinions? The truth is, is that a lot of times they change over time. In fact, we have no reason to look any further than 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 11. You know why? Because Paul, towards the end of his life, writes the second epistle to Timothy. He knows his time is short. And as he's telling Timothy to come and bring parchments and bring a blanket and bring, uh, or bring his coat and bring other things with him, he says, Timothy, I want you to bring John Mark with, me, with you. Get Mark and bring him with you, with you, for he is very useful to me in ministry. If Paul had taken the time here in Acts 15 to tell Barnabas how empty-headed he was for wanting to bring this, this, this ragamuffin along with him, and if he had said some things about Barnabas and impeaching his character and said some things about John Mark and impeaching his character and really uh, just, just running them through the mud, do you suppose that that bond of fellowship would have been destroyed? That the distance that he so advised here in Acts 15 would have destroyed that relationship to where when Paul called for John Mark towards the end of his life there in 2 Timothy 4, John Mark would have said, no, I'm not going. I'm done being bullied by him. Paul didn't let his opinion, Paul didn't let his matter of judgment affect and hurt the body of Christ. But he realized that his brother, Mark, could be a blessing to him at the end of his life. Our lives change. Our situations and our circumstances change. You know what doesn't change? The glorious gospel of Christ. The mission that we have to uphold all things that Christ taught. All things that the apostles faithfully carried down. All things that pertain to life and godliness. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3 or 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, we have the responsibility to hold on to God's word that doesn't change, just like Jesus Christ doesn't change. And you and I, though we change, and though our life circumstances change, though our opinions may change, we're so committed to Christ that we don't want to destroy the beauty of what he's created in the church for something as passing, as transitory as our opinion. When we think about our mission, especially as the Graber Road Church of Christ, when we think about our ministry of the gospel, our desire is to simply be as loving and as gracious as our Lord was. And that's always going to be a challenge. But let's meet that challenge like Jesus. Let's meet that challenge looking at one another and seeing a soul that wants to know God better. Maybe you're not a Christian this morning. Maybe you're, uh, if you've tuned in over the last eight weeks to these, uh, to these sermons, Bible classes, however it is that you've uh, come in contact with us, we are putting on the screen at this time this plan. It's not my plan. This is not the elders' plan. This is not anybody's plan here at the Great Road Church of Christ, but it is Christ's plan for how one comes to know him and how one comes to obey the gospel and how we look at our lives and say, this is something that I need. I know Jesus died for my sins. I know that, that his blood can cleanse me and where I don't have to live under the crushing guilt and burden of the past. And I know the good news, and that is good news, not only that God looks at our past and says, I'm going to choose to forget that, and then he looks at our future and says, I'm going to give this person what they don't deserve. I'm going to give them the promise of a better life, a better life, a life that's lived in friendship with God, in reconciliation through the blood of Jesus Christ. That is good news. But it involves us repenting of our sins, turning away from those things that we did in, uh, in ignorance and rebellion against God, and turning to him, looking into his word and saying, I see how he wants me to live, and that's just how I want to live for the rest of my life. It involves naming Christ as, as master, as Lord, as Savior, and saying, I want Jesus to be my Lord. And then being immersed into water for the forgiveness of sins. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. When you come up out of the water, Romans chapter 6 says you've died to sin. That old man is crucified. And you are raised to walk in newness of life out of the waters of baptism. And walking like Christ 
walked, living like he lived, and being faithful to God through him and walking every day to glory. If you don't have that this morning, you can. Get in contact with us, please. Send me an email. Send Troy an email. Send, uh, look at that uh, website that's there on the screen, freehomebiblestudy.org, and go online and, and study and, and learn more about the gospel because that's exactly what God wants us to be about. As the church, we want to be centered around Christ and about the mission of Christ and the cause of Christ. But in the church, we want to be about loving as Christ loved. Centered on the doctrine of Christ, but showing the love of Christ in our lives. He paid a day, he did not owe, I owed a debt. I could not pay, I needed someone to wash my sins away. Amazing grace, Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. He paid that debt at Calvary, He cleansed my soul and set me free. I'm glad that Jesus did all my sins erase. I now can see. Amazing grace, Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. One day he's coming back for me to live with him eternally. Won't it be glory to see him on that day? Thank you for the lesson this morning, Andy. I have a few announcements that I'd like to share with you and then we'll close our worship service with a prayer. We want to rejoice with the Hankins family as Caitlin was baptized last Sunday, May 3rd. Let's remember to pray for Caitlin and keep the Hankins family in our prayers as she begins her new walk with God. Uh, Oliver Albright is now home from the hospital. He's on some different medications now, but still has swelling. We want to pray for uh, swift answers from his doctors on how to help Oliver better. The McLeod son, Marshall, is having some health concerns right now, and, and he would benefit from our prayers. We want to keep the Roberts family in our prayers as Jeff's mother, Ann, passed away on Thursday, May 7th. We want to keep Jeff, Betty, Kira, and the rest of the Roberts family in our prayers. Until we can meet together again, we want to continue to tune in to our YouTube content for Bible class lessons, uh, Sunday morning sermons, devotionals, etc. And we want to uh, uh, just remind you that you can search for Graber Road Church of Christ on YouTube. Ladies' Bible class will continue to conduct uh, Wednesday uh, classes at 10 a.m. on Zoom. Please check the bulletin for the meeting code and password. Uh, also, Andy is conducting a youth Bible study at 6 p.m. on Wednesday evenings on Zoom as well, and the, co the code to join will be the same each week. Continue to stop what you are doing every evening at 8 p.m. and pray for uh, our, our church family, our congregation, and our situation. Uh, on Tuesday, May 12th, we want to make special recognition as Frank and Mickey Rizzuto will be celebrating their 70th wedding anniversary. Also, please check uh, your email or your mail for the reminder as there are other announcements in there that are important as well. Let's have a prayer together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the time that we have spent together in worship. We're thankful for the teachings 
of your word that Andy and Troy so carefully uh, provide to us and share with us. We're thankful that uh, we have your word uh, to guide us and lead us as we try to live lives that are acceptable to you. Father, we pray that you bless the things that we've done this morning, that we have indeed worshiped you in spirit and in truth. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to read and study your word and understand what your will is. Father, we pray that you help each one of us to strive to follow your word and to follow it carefully and to look to one another with love and concern and make sure that we try to interact with our fellow man in ways that can teach and bless them with the teachings of your word so that they may be able to receive salvation as well. Father, we're thankful for the blessings that we have of this life physically. We are thankful for the care and the, the keeping that you provided our congregation. We're mindful that we have had loss and other events occur throughout the past couple of months, and we pray for our family that have experienced those difficulties and help them to know that we love them and that we're keeping them in our prayers and holding them up to you. Father, we're thankful for the spiritual blessings that we have in Jesus. We're thankful for the salvation that he brings our lives. We pray for forgiveness for our sins. We pray for better hearts, and we pray for wisdom that we can live better lives. Father, we pray that you continue to watch over and bless us, and this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Till we meet.